This tutorial is brought to you by one of the authors of Revising Professional Writing, now in its third edition. My students call me Dr. Kim. The publishers made this video available under a Creative Commons license. For more information, contact parlaypress.com. Remember, you can use the pause button at any time, and if you see shadows or something weird on the screen, try changing your playback quality settings. Well, the view you see here includes everything you might learn about professional writing in my tutorials. There are others that help you understand content development, organization, style, and mechanics, as well as the rhetorical context that determines which content, organization, or style is going to be effective in a specific situation. Primary interest in this tutorial is the message itself. Effective mechanics can only be judged by taking into account the writer's purpose and audience. If you haven't listened to the tutorials on rhetorical context yet, you should. Alright, this tutorial focuses on the mechanics of subject-verb agreement. And we're going to think about this in the context of professional writing. We'll be considering mechanics mostly from a letter of application for an internship. The quality in the video makes it nearly impossible for you to read on the screen. If you're a student using our book, your instructor can provide you with a copy, or you can always download one at prosewrite.com. This letter was sent by a university student to someone at a company she's never met. I've revised the original letter that came from Monster.com to create two versions for instructional purposes. The audience for the letter is a finance manager named Mr. Crowley. He's hired interns from the student's university in the past. He's not an expert on the content of the letter and is moderately sensitive or skeptical about it. That means the writer has to increase the reader's readiness to accept the letter's content by providing both informative and persuasive information. I've created this tutorial for professionals who are native English speakers. Research shows that not all grammatical problems get the same level of negative attention from workplace readers. Business people from North America form highly negative opinions based on disagreement between subjects and verbs, so that is the focus of this tutorial. In English, subject-verb disagreement means the two words don't match in terms of number. Problems with disagreement are nearly always limited to cases in which the identity of the subject is ambiguous. That means recognizing the grammatical subject of a sentence is at the root of understanding subject-verb agreement. Instead of repeating definitions of the grammatical categories that have probably been of little help to you up to this point, I'll provide an operational definition that you probably have not encountered before. With the exception of a few distinct dialects, native speakers of English don't use verbs that disagree with subjects when the two words appear next to each other. Sentence one just doesn't occur in either speech or writing. But English allows words to appear between the subject and verb, and that sometimes makes it difficult to determine which noun functions as the subject. Let's apply an operational test to identify the subject in sentence three. In English, any declarative sentence, you might have called this an independent clause in the past, can be transformed into a tag question. Sentence 3a shows how this works. A tag question includes an ending with an auxiliary verb form, like is, in our example, which has been made negative, so we've got isn't, and a pronoun, like he. Forming a tag ending for a declarative sentence helps you identify the subject of that sentence, because the pronoun always refers back to the subject. So any native speaker of English knows he means employee in sentence 3. That means employee is the subject. Let's try the test on another example sentence. How would you form the tag ending for sentence 4? If you used hasn't it, which uses the singular pronoun it, what does it refer to? I mean, delivery is the only singular noun. But native speakers intuitively know that it isn't delivery that has stopped in this sentence. The red question marks denote that this tag ending doesn't really work. If you used hasn't they when you formed the tag ending, uses the plural pronoun they, 
and native speakers know that they refers to estimates. That matches the meaning of the sentence. It does sound bad or funny, because has doesn't really go with singular nouns. Again, the red question marks show that this tag ending doesn't work. At this point, you've identified the subject of sentence 4 as estimates. The only option for creating a tag ending, sentence 4, that maintains the meaning and sounds right is shown here. Plural pronoun they refers back to estimates, and it goes with the plural verb haven't. That means sentence 4 displays subject-verb disagreement, and it needs to be revised, as shown here. Let's tackle a few more examples. There are two common situations where subject-verb disagreement appears. The first is with subjects that contain prepositional phrases. In fact, this was the situation with the example on the previous slide, where we had accurate estimates for delivery. For delivery is a prepositional phrase. But let's consider a sentence from the letter of application for an internship. If you look to the left of has, the first verb form in the sentence, we see the courses in my major. There are two nouns, courses and major, which is the subject. If you use the tag ending test, you should recognize that haven't they is the choice that conveys the right meaning and uses a subject and verb that agree in number. That means the original sentence displays subject-verb disagreement. The prepositional phrase in my major includes a singular noun that occurs next to the verb, but courses rather than the singular major is the subject so the verb should be in plural form. In the revised sentence, that singular has has been changed to the plural have. The writer avoids the negative attention earned from business readers who encounter disagreement. The second situation in which subject-verb disagreement appears is with subjects that contain relative clauses. Consider another sentence from the letter of application for an internship. Here, if we look to the left of provide, the first verb form in the sentence, we see a long string of words, my resume, which is attached as PDF and Word files. There are two nouns that might serve as the subject, resume and files. If you use the tag ending test, you should recognize that doesn't it is the choice that conveys the right meaning and has the right subject and verb next to each other. That means the subject in this sentence is singular, but the sentence displays subject-verb disagreement because it uses a plural form of the verb, provide. The relative clause, which is attached as, etc., etc., includes a plural noun that occurs next to the verb, but resume rather than files is the subject, so the verb should be in the singular form. In the revised sentence, singular provides, with an S on the end, has replaced the plural provide. There's no mechanical issue to create any negative attention. Time to check your understanding of agreement by revising a sentence you haven't seen before. Pause the recording. Look at this example from a different job application email. You look to the left of includes, the first verb form in the sentence, you see my electives and upper division finance. If you use the tag ending test, you should have recognized that don't they is the choice that conveys the right meaning and uses subject and a verb that agree in number. That means the subject of the sentence is plural, and the verb needs to be revised to the plural form, include. And that's what you see in the revised version here. To help you understand how to recognize and fix subject-verb agreement problems, I've referred to a letter of application for an internship. The reader of that letter is more likely to be ready to accept the writer's request for an interview if the writer avoids disagreement. Research has shown that business people make three types of judgments about the person who uses non-standard English in workplace documents. First, they judge that as a writer, the person is careless or uninformed. Second, they judge that as a professional, 
the person demonstrates faulty thinking or isn't a detail person or is poorly educated. And three, they judge that as an organizational representative, the person conveys the wrong message to customers or legal matters. Any of those judgments make it less likely the writer of this letter will get an interview with the reader's organization. Okay, I know, the bad news is that, like it or not, people judge you based on the mechanics of what you write. The good news is that there aren't many grammar problems that are likely to trigger negative judgments from the majority of workplace readers. The goal of this tutorial was to make sure you master one of them.